So hi, hello and welcome, Microbe Hunter here. I'm still checking if everything works here. Um, hello and welcome to another Saturday live stream. Oh, okay, now I can... Ah, yeah, okay, now I actually see that it started to run on YouTube as well. Okay, um, so yes, now officially uh, here I am. Hi, um, hello everyone. Um, Today I would like uh, to look at some pollen from honey under the microscope. I would also like to uh, later on uh, yeah, talk about a little question that somebody posed. So a little bit of uh, philosophy of science as well. Here's the question. How can you prove that viruses exist? I know it's a totally different, uh, totally different uh, um, yeah, topic uh, to, uh, to the pollen, but I still want to talk a few minutes about this as well. Sound is great and video is good. That's very nice. Uh, first of all, yeah, I see that many people already started to join in um, from all over the world. Um, usually more and more people start to join in over the next couple of, um, of minutes. And what I would like to do today is, is um, I'm going to um, use again my centrifuge, which I placed on the floor here, to do a little bit of uh, centrifuging of, um, of honey. Okay, um, it's a pretty fairly easy uh, thing uh, to do, and I also would like to, yeah, um, yeah, show you then um, how I'm concentrating the specimens, and I would like to simply show them to you um, under the microscope. And I also would like to share with you a few resources um, um, about pollen identification. Okay, well, um, let's uh, go through the chat uh, for the first couple of minutes because more and more people are joining in, so I have to give it a little bit of time uh, in, in at the beginning. So there, the first question to me is, yeah, and if you want to ask questions, please uh, add an uh, at Oliver or at Microbe Hunter, please, so that it's easy for me to find. And there's already been a question even before the start of the live stream if there are any book recommendations about uh, microbiology in general. And there is one book that I do recommend. It's not so cheap, uh, but it's a standard college-level book. Um, um, it's called uh, Biology of Microorganisms by the authors Brock and Madigan. It can, it can be bought, of course, all over Amazon. It's a pretty thick volume. Um, it's uh, very colorful. I used it myself during the university studies a long time ago and gives you a general overview. Um, however, it is not a book specifically for microscopy. Okay? It's uh, um, yeah, basically um, uh, general microbiology. Okay, so uh, hello from mecklenburg vorpommern and a dark field about 40 times regarding the swift. That's possible. You can do that. You just need to make a proper dark field filter. I did a little bit of uh, chatting in Esperanto because it's also one of my other hobbies that I have. I love the constructed language Esperanto. Hello from Vietnam. Okay, from the Netherlands, from Belgium. Okay, from Germany. Um, and so on and so on. Okay, from London, from Brazil and from the UK. So what I would like to do, first of all, thank you very much uh, because uh, Adrian sent me um, again a couple of pictures um, of pollen that he made and I would like to show them to you first and if you also would like to um, contribute a little bit to the live stream, you can of course send me pictures and, and small videos, uh, video clips to at uh, um, oliver at microbehunter.com. So that's, uh, it is oliver at microbehunter.com and here are some of the pollen videos uh, from pictures and I put them into a small video. Um, now pollen identification is a pretty advanced science I think, okay? There's so many um, hundreds if not thousand different types of plant species out there and identifying the plant based on the pollen can be uh, quite a challenge. Uh, I'm not an expert in that. I'll be yeah, uh, open about that right away. Um, but I can show you a couple of resources here. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, the study of pollen is a, a very fascinating thing, especially uh, people who are um, hobby beekeepers, for example, sometimes they will do microscopy of pollen simply to check uh, which plants the bees have visited. So there is also a under quotation marks, a, a very useful application um, to studying um, of pollen, okay? So, um, so what is the proportion of alcohol um, and ether that is used to clean microscope lenses? I can just tell you that, what I have read somewhere. First of all, if you want to clean, clean your microscope lenses, always follow the instructions of the uh, manufacturer. Do not use any cleaning solvents for eyeglasses, but the proportion of alcohol to ether that I once read was 30% alcohol, 
70% ether and because there is so much ether in it it's highly volatile this basically means that the ether is able to evaporate very quickly and I think I might actually do a separate video once on how to clean microscope optics because you just don't wipe over it using a lens paper but there's a certain technique that you have to use okay but it's 70% uh, ether and 30% alcohol so this is basically thank you again very much for the poll um, and before I actually start with a practical thing I would like to show you something here I'm going to show you my desk now here this is my desk and um, yeah somebody sent me also a, a link uh, yeah it's unfortunate or fortunately or unfortunately it's in German um, yeah but it's, that's uh, basically it was a PDF that was sent to me and this is microscopy for teachers and uh, nature friends nature explorers and there is a quite an interesting yeah um, yeah a lot, lot of text here a description on how to prepare um, how to prepare pollen okay um, so generally what I'm trying to say here is is that there are a lot of resources also available online PDF documents and so on um, also antique ones so sometimes uh, uh, documents that are not in copyright anymore are available for free download and they're quite, still quite useful however I would like to show you something else here and this is a part uh, of a research paper that one of my students has written many several years ago and, and she has actually also studied pollen and uh, from honey and you tried to identify them yeah, so this was a, a, a student's uh, a research project so I just want to show you she basically uh, took pictures of the pollen and then based on a reference she tried to identify what the pollen are um, and she tried to do that with different types of honey and there to thereby to classify this and uh, if you're also interested in pollen analysis and you also would like to see those reference pictures somewhere I can actually show them to you uh, because there is an online database um, that um, she actually used and I need to switch over now to the Windows view oh that's my YouTube video just a second over here yeah it's called Pollen Wiki and uh, yeah it's, it's a Swiss uh, website you know what I'm just gonna copy paste okay um, I'm going, just going to copy paste the uh, this into yeah that is the okay I hope that you're able to see this yeah so this is basically where you can uh, yeah um, download uh, not download but actually have a look at, um, um, at this uh, web page here okay and uh, yeah it's a pretty uh, pretty good one and if you just go over here list of species yeah, then you can go down here yeah, and if you click on on one of those then you're able to actually see a picture um, of uh, the pollen for reference so if you want to actually do a little bit of pollen identification yourself then you can actually have a look um, yeah um, at um, at this web page which I consider um, quite quite useful okay let's have a look at here it's, it describes the plant now um, I know everything is in German here but you can actually go uh, uh, paste copy paste the link into Google Translate and then you should, should be able to see everything in English as well so I consider this uh, to be a very useful resource and it's also the uh, the resource uh, that uh, yeah um, she has been using a great book is pollen identification for beekeepers okay that's also thank you very much okay um, and the question here is why are the pollen different shapes uh, do the shapes give them some kind of advantage over others um, <laughs> if that's a, a good question this is an evolutionary biology question yeah? so basically what the evolutionary advantage do certain shapes have um, and uh, I'm quite sure that uh, the shapes uh, do have a certain advantage uh, but sometimes um, it is like this that uh, evolution only selects uh, for negative aspects so if there is um, let's put it this way um, if uh, there is no disadvantage uh, then the pollen and the plants are able to survive so in other words that's uh, yeah um, then sometimes there is not always a an advantage but sometimes uh, the absence of a disadvantage is also already enough yeah um, but nature is very diverse and it simply shows that uh, sometimes there are multiple ways um, how to solve a certain problem yeah. so this is a little bit um, a, 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 yeah one of the, the aspects here so um, that's one thing um, another thing that I would like to show you what is this one over here yeah I did make a YouTube video some uh, time ago um, also on this very channel um, about pollen germination um, and um, I tried to do that again I didn't um, um, get, yeah I'm still working on this uh, to, to optimize this a little bit but this is one of the videos that uh, I actually made uh, some time ago um, where I was uh, if you add some sugar solution of the right concentration and some of the pollen are able to actually grow a pollen tube just wanted to share this uh, with you um, as well and 
uh, thank you also for a book recommendation that I got, illustrated Paul terminology. And believe it or not, this uh, book can actually be uh, downloaded. Um, yeah, and I put the link into the description um, of this uh, video here. Yeah, so there is um, actually uh, yeah a book that can be downloaded here. Um, it, it's a pretty extensive book, right? Um, but I just thought that for those of you who are a little bit more interested, uh, yeah, you, yeah, also some some beautiful drawings here. Yeah. It's a modern book, by the way, and so some electron micrograph uh, electron micrographs here. It is a modern book, but um, yeah. Lots of electron micrographic images. That might be a little bit of a disadvantage uh, because, um, of course, uh, most of us have light microscopes, so it looks uh, the pollen do look a little bit different. But still, I think it's a very valuable um, yeah, and a good resource if you're more interested in that. Yeah, so a whole bunch of uh, basic uh, biology as well. Yeah, uh -huh. here's some uh, light micrographs as well. Yeah, so I'm just uh, saying uh, I, again, I am not, uh, I am not myself, uh, um, yeah, a palynologist. That's actually nice because over here you see um, also the electron micrographs and also light uh, uh, under the light microscope. Yeah, so it can actually also help here. Okay, so uh, another resource that I would like to share with you, and which is not directly related uh, to pollen. But uh, um, I found this very nice resource, also free for download. It is in German, but you can actually also get it uh, translated. And this is a general um, introduction into microscopy with a whole bunch of, uh, of nice uh, yeah, experiments and, and, and practical yeah, things here. If you want to get this whole thing translated, uh, then that is, of course, also uh, possible. There is somewhere, if you just, um, yeah, Pollen, yeah, okay. I got it translated over here. There are those free PDF translation sites, and you just upload the PDF, and then you get a Google translated, uh, um, yeah, PDF um, in English. Of course, the the language might not be quite as as good. I mean, it's translated, but these days the translations are good enough so that you're able to make sense of the things here. Yeah. So I just wanted to recommend this here as well um, because um, yeah, it's a nice introductory book, and if you're interested in in um, yeah in microscopy generally, or if you think about picking up on that hobby, and uh, if you want to get a couple of uh, inspirations on what to observe under the microscope, then um, I, I recommend this this one over here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, explain sample preparation. I think this one here is one of the more useful or one of the most useful uh, graphs here. Yeah. Um, how do you prepare an object if the object is thin over here? Um, yeah. Or or thick? Yeah. Um, what basically? Um, what are the steps that you should do? Right. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, if it's thin and highly pigmented, yeah, then you have to bleach it down here and so on. Yeah? So this is uh, this flowchart is actually quite uh, quite uh, useful as well. Um, an overview of uh, over important dyes that you can use. Okay, so that's basically something I, I um, yeah just also wanted to share with you, and I put the link uh, to the original also in the description below. Okay, so um, yeah, so what I'm going to yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> I knew I should have taken German in college. I have to say one thing. That's uh, one of the things that surprises me uh, myself a little bit is, is that um, I found far more high quality uh, German microscopy books than English ones. It's, it's really strange. Um, there are, um, yeah, I've, uh, I really tried to make a, a, a nice collection, but there are some really good German speaking identification books, uh, um, general microscopy books, more advanced. I don't know why. Um, I suppose, and that's my, my, my <laughs> interpretation or theory, that uh, because of uh, microscopy has uh, been a, because of, of the company, Zeiss company and, and Leica, these were very well established traditionally a very well established or are well, well established uh, microscopy companies and I suppose from that yeah, time I, I guess there seems to be a strong tradition which surprises me because um, hobby microscopy especially during the Victorian times was very very popular in the United Kingdom in, in Great Britain um, yeah, so there is uh, yeah there is also a very strong tradition there um, but for whatever strange reason uh, yeah there are more, there's more stuff available. Yeah, uh, are these papers ever translated? Um, let's put it this way: um, the ones that um, I could not find the original an, an English version, so I did, did, did a translation. Um, yeah, over um, over an online tool. Yeah. So I just wanted to share a few uh, um, things like this uh, um, with you. Um, yeah, this is basically I'm using number sixty times. Um, 
an objective here and normally when you put honey under the microscope I'm going to go down with the, uh, with the magnification a little bit so that you get a better, better overview um, it's a little too much now um, you see a lot of tiny little uh, yeah, debris but all of those large circles larger circles that you see are pollen okay that is a little bit I don't know some kind of a fiber either a contaminant on, on, on the slide or it wasn't honey but generally if you put honey directly under the microscope you're rarely rarely able to find such a a high concentration so what you need to do is you need to concentrate it and a couple of months ago when I've done something similar I actually also far and found some 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 bee parts as well okay and uh, I think it's also um, a good way to check if your honey actually is uh, is natural because these days there are of course also artificial honeys available yeah so um, and then you can uh, take pictures of this and then try to identify them if, if this is actually something that you want to do okay so um, yeah, you can use ChatGPT also to translate this. Yeah, um, that's also possible. ChatGPT is, is, is surprisingly good um, also for translation. But um, uh, yeah, sometimes Google Translate also works. And something that I also recommend is, is that there is the Google Translate app on the mobile phone. And with that, you can take a picture and then it will translate that. Okay, so that's um, yeah also a possibility. So um, yeah, so that, that's basically uh, a short, uh, brief uh, in, in, in introduction, okay? And um, now let's uh, do a little bit of, 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 of um, honey uh, microscopy. Um, yeah, let's put this away here. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at the honey. So uh, that, that's the honey, okay? Uh, yeah, I'm going to hide the brand. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I'm not, of course, I'm not, not sponsored or anything. Uh, why, why this honey? Because I happen to have it at home. Okay, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah, and it's it's a it's a nice honey, right? Um, uh, and I basically uh, just want to uh, now um, extract uh, some of the pollen here. And what you have to do in this case is is you have to dilute it with water. Okay, um, so that is uh, that's the thing. Um, and uh, what I found out today, let's move this a little bit over here. By um, what I found out today by trial and error, and also in the previous <laughs> months when I tried that, is, is uh, if I add maximum of approximately two milliliters of, of honey and fill it up uh, to 15 milliliters um, with water and then dilute it, then that will be fine. Okay? Because honey itself is too viscous, you cannot centrifuge it. So, um, yeah, so this is basically what I'm gonna try. I'm gonna move up the camera a little bit. I do have this, yeah, this camera here. And uh, yeah, so it's still in focus, and uh, I'm just going to yeah add a little bit. That's a centrifugation tube, of course. You can get them over I don't know Amazon. Yeah, and now I'm going to do this very unprofessionally. I'm just going to yeah put it over the tube and simply squeeze. Okay, and add a little bit of honey in here. Yeah, so that should be yeah enough okay um if you basically hold the, the bottle against uh, the light you're going to see it's slightly it's slightly turbid yeah and that is because of of, uh, of pollen particles and so on in the honey right so the next thing is and this requires quite a bit of patience i mean i could do actually actually i just realized something i didn't think of that is this by maybe by changing the concentration of, of the honey you're also changing the density so maybe you can do some kind of like selective centrifugation depending on the density um, or and the viscosity maybe you can actually um, make sure that only certain parts uh, particles will actually centrifuge okay so that is number one um th that's actually more than 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 two i mean ooh, it's already a little much but what i will do now is, is i'm going to simply add um, some water. I'm going to fill it up with water. And this is where the, we really need a lot of patience now. Okay. I'm going to put on the cap and make it, uh, yeah. And then now I have to do this for a couple of minutes. Okay. And you know what? Why not? Why not try the following? I'm going to, um, just for, for trial purposes, I'm going to now add much more honey. And uh, we're going to see how, if there's a difference. Maybe much less and much more. How's that? Okay. I'm going to add maybe much more honey. See how much this is actually. Um, and uh, maybe there's a difference, maybe there isn't. I have to be honest with you, I never, I didn't try that. Okay. So let's uh, again um, add a little bit of water all the way. And then, of course, we have to balance everything. 
because that's going to be the next challenge. I have to balance everything uh, before I, yeah. So that's now um, quite a bit more. And uh, yeah, you know what? Um, I don't have a pen now for labeling. Yeah. Maybe pencil will work. I don't know if I'm able to. Number one, oh, I can't see it. No, I'll, yeah. Maybe, really, I'm, I'm super well prepared. Um. Okay. Hmm. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do it. The, I'm going to scratch in a one here. That's the the one for the two milliliters. Then a two, maybe two lines over here. Okay, one, two, and uh, I'm now going to add uh, quite a bit more. I actually have to really make sure that this is going to be dissolved. This is going to take ages now. Okay. Honestly, I don't think that this. I think this is already going to be enough. I'm just going to try it with those two. Okay, so um, yeah, I have to basically uh, really make sure that it's properly dissolved in water. Okay, um, maybe warming it up would also help a little bit. You see, but you already see it in the color difference that uh, which one's more concentrated. And then I have to balance it out. Okay, so and, and while I'm doing that, I'm reading again some of the comments. Water dilution over low vis viscosity and centrifugation would be my guess for uh, yeah, to concentrate solid. Yes, um, so that's basically the thing is um, if uh, I do not dilute it, then the pollen are going to stay suspended and then I'm not able to concentrate them. Yeah? So um, you can use glycerin jelly um, to stain pollen during the mounting process. Okay. Um, Glycerin jelly contains basic fuchsin. Yes, okay, there's a stain. I actually also have some, I might try this as well. I also have some, some um, methylene blue here, okay? Um, and I've heard that pasteurizing can mess with the pollen, but I'm not sure how. Well, um, if you're pasteurizing something, if you're basically heating it up, and you, of course, do that in order to destroy, let's say, bacteria, uh, then this will, will of course, uh, um, also denature any proteins in the pollen, so you, you're killing off the pollen as well. But that really doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm seeing, okay, yeah, put it on the coffee warmer. <laughs> yes, uh, that's actually that would have been a good idea, uh, the coffee warmer. Uh, but then I should have uh, probably put it on, um, yeah, so with a water bath. Okay. Yeah, I bought myself um, a coffee warmer, um, which uh, um, yeah speeds up the drying of um, yeah of microscope slides. Okay. Yeah, it's slowly. It's actually slowly working. But uh, of course, the more uh, of the honey uh, becomes diluted. Um, the more concentrated the water becomes, um, yeah, the longer it will take. Huh? But actually, yeah, we just we're just patient a little bit. Um, a story from from my lab work when I was actually at university a long time ago. Um, I was uh, I'll just tell you a little bit of, of what I did during my from a master's thesis. I studied at the University of Vienna in Austria. Um, with a degree in research microbiology. So my um, topic, my research topic or my research thesis for the master's thesis was not so much in, in genetic engineering or molecular biology like uh, most people did, but what mine was more in um, analytical chemistry of uh, um, the composition of bacteria. So basically by analyzing the, by analyzing the chemical composition of bacteria, um, you can actually um, kind of identify them what they are. Yeah? And these days, of course, it's probably much easier and faster to do a DNA analysis. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, by analyzing the chemical components of, let's say, the cell membrane, um, yeah, you basically um, um, are also able to, to characterize them. And uh, yeah, one thing that I had to do is I had to extract the fatty acids um, of the membrane of the bacteria. And uh, I had to do this, uh, and I had to do a so-called a saponification reaction with uh, sodium hydroxide and so on. And we were using, of course, uh, test tubes. And I remember um, I had to sit there and I had to shake test tubes for hours. You could not uh, use a mechanical device um, because it would have been a too aggressive. And I was actually sitting there like this for, for a couple of hours <laughs> every day. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, because uh, you shouldn't uh, have any bubbles making, so you had to gently shake it. Yeah, it was uh, quite uh, quite a bit of. <laughs> yeah, reminds me. This activity reminds me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's, I'm still reading now some of the, the questions here. How do you clean the test tubes? Is it possible to find a honey particle next time you use the same test tube? Um, let's put it this way. Uh, I'm avoiding the problem I'm, uh, I'm, of the question. Uh, these are disposable um, centrifugation tubes. So generally, in, in, when you're actually um, doing real lab work, not just for hobby purposes uh, here, but when you're doing real lab work, then you would actually throw them away after you've used them. Um, for our purposes, uh, if you rinse them out properly, um, and uh, then generally um, it's going to be fine. Um, there might be some uh, particles left in there, but if you rinse them out, they're going to be so few that they shouldn't disturb uh, when you actually put them under the microscope. Yeah? So I would give them a proper rinse, uh, probably use even some kind of maybe compressed water a little bit, and then you can um, clean it out. And if you see that not everything, if something actually becomes dry and stuck in there, then um, yeah, you just basically um, you just throw it away. Yeah? Let me see. It's the important thing is, is that there is no honey at, at the tip. Yeah. Let me. Uh, seems to be, I don't know. Yeah, let me flick this here. See, if there is honey here on the tip, then this is the place where actually uh, the, um, the pellet should collect. But this could, be, so we have to really make sure that there is no, not so much uh, here. The question is, is um, here, if this is not in um, any way a little bit too viscous, I don't know. Okay, so that's gonna be an experiment. I've not tried this myself. Tap it. Oh. Maybe this works better. You see over here on yeah, yeah. This could also be because of. It could also be because of of. Uh, uh, this is the surface tension. Okay. So um, let's do now the following. Uh-huh. I see that it's not quite. It's not quite uh, tight. So uh, now I have to do the following. I have to balance this. Okay. So I've got myself this ba- scale here, and uh, okay, let's put this on here. And uh, yeah, I have to make sure. Let's take the one that has more. I think it looks a little bit like there's a little bit more in here. Let's put this on here with a cap. And Tara means we want to go to zero. Okay, we're not zero. Okay, and uh, up. we have to make sure that this one is now also at zero and it's actually heavier than the other one. Look at this. It's actually heavier than the other one. Up, I dropped the cap. Here we go. So let's go Tara again. Okay, so let's uh, put this on to the side and let's add here. Yes, uh, it's one and a half mil grams. The density of the honey, of course, also has an effect. Uh, I see. So here we go. Okay, um, same mass. That is kind of important. And now, and now we can um, yeah, put it away. And now we can put it into the centrifuge. And I really don't know. I really don't know um, what the difference is going to be. But look, uh, it has the same mass, but notice how uh, the volume is different. Yeah? Yeah, it actually shows that the one with the more honey, um, there is less volume because the honey is more dense, actually. Okay? So um, let's, let's give it a try. Okay? Um, so after a couple of minutes of shaking, uh, we have to now spin it, uh, centrifuge it for a couple of minutes. So I have to change the camera now. I've got six cameras connected to this computer. So the USB ports are a little bit um, (laughs) stretched. (laughs) So I hope that this works. So I'm going to disappear now under the table. And um, yeah, this is basically a cheap centrifuge. And uh, I'm going to spin it now for a couple of minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna leave uh, my seat now and I'm gonna disappear under the table.
So, yeah, let's uh, see how this works. I'm usually I'm giving it about five to seven minutes. Um, hope you're able to still hear me properly. Uh, there is a little bit of a noise here, of course, now because of the centrifuge. And um, yeah, and uh, I just want to also show you um, what I've made already today in the afternoon. Yeah, here this is another. Nah, you won't be able to see it. There's a small pellet um, at the bottom then um, where you have. Uh, all of the concentrated particles, okay? So I'm just gonna quickly uh, go through the sections here to the questions. Ah, yeah, interesting. There is a slow mover for blood samples that would have been useful instead of manual shaking. Mm -hmm. You, you, okay, it's an, a comment here about uh, the different categories of honey, raw and pasteurized. They're very different. Pasteurization can take away some qualities like beneficial enzymes, floral flavors and pollen. So uh, the pasteurization or heating uh, will of course uh, destroy or will denature um, uh, of course also plant proteins. Um, but um, it's also known that uh, it's not always a good idea to give infants, babies honey. Um, at least not the raw honey because there can be some bacteria in the honey that can cause some problems as well Okay, but uh, generally because yeah um, of the um, of the high sugar content That's why and because honey is acidic this also inhibits bacterial growth. So what is your rotation speed? Just a second So the maximum rotation speed is uh, 4,000 that the uh, centrifuge is able uh, to, to do. You see two knobs. The, uh, from your view now, the, the left knob, that is uh, the, uh, the speed, and the right knob is a timer. Uh, I rarely, I'm, I'm rarely using a timer. Okay, so this is actually a fairly slow centrifuge, but it's it's enough. And uh, for those of you who've already watched some of my previous videos, uh, that's actually quite useful for um, also collecting algae that uh, can be found floating in the water. So, so sometimes you can use a plankton net to filter out the algae, but this also works. If you want to do some pollen analysis, um, or like I have done here, and if you do not have a centrifuge, uh, what you simply do is, is you simply mix it with water, and then you let it stand overnight because the pollen um, also is heavier and it will also sink uh, sink downwards now it won't be quite as compact um, as when you centrifuge it okay uh, but it should also work um, and the reason why I know that is is because this tube that I prepared today in the afternoon I let it stand for a couple of hours and I could actually see that even though there's in this uh, droplet over here um, you have some of the solid particles again collected on the bottom Okay, and I think uh, again, what's really important is is that uh, you add sufficient amount of water uh, so that it does not become too dense. Yeah? Yes, four thousand rotations per minute. Okay, that's at least the one that I see uh, um, over um, yeah um, over here, right? So um, I don't know how yeah I'll give it a couple of more minutes uh, and then we're going to see how how well this actually uh, worked. Okay. Um, it's also possible, of course, uh, to. Uh, I've not tried this uh, because uh, the. Uh, yeah, but um, if you really have a large amount of blood, for example, then you can also, of course, centrifuge blood this way and separate the different blood particles. Yeah. I used to repair scientific centrifuges. One was 10, uh, yeah, a, a million RPM. Okay, um, yeah, it was as big as a washing machine. I also used those centrifuges um, for you've got different types uh, of centrifuges for not only different amounts of liquid but also for different substances. So, for example, for centrifuging DNA, you're using also high speed centrifuges that are quite small that fit on the table, and then we used centrifuges, and those rotors were extremely heavy. Right, um, and they were as big as yeah, as big as a washing machine. Okay, so and so this is uh, yeah. Tini is asking, wait, what? Well, I guess your question is about the centrifuge. 
Yeah, there were uh, the rotors uh, that where you put those tubes in. Yeah, here I mean that's a pretty cheap one that we've got here, right? It's not heavy at all, and it's uh, cheap. I don't know how much. I think I paid uh, less than forty euros for the centrifuge. Um, but um, for very high-speed centrifuges, if the mass is off a very small amount, okay, uh, if the mass is off a very small amount, then uh, uh, essentially it causes a lot of difference in, uh, in, in, in um, and shaking, uh, yeah, because the forces are much higher. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So let me quickly see here. Okay. So this is a uh, yeah. You need uh, sometimes high rotation speeds, um, uh, um, um, especially for, for DNA, for example, when you want to extract DNA, uh, then you're mixing the solution that you have with alcohol and the alcohol causes the DNA to precipitate out um, and then you have a, a small DNA pellet. But you do not use large test or uh, centrifugation tubes like this, but actually small, small ones. Okay. Yeah, by the way, this is a, yeah, these are also slightly larger centrifugation tubes that I have here, and I use those um, for, um, actually simply, I always take them along simply for collecting uh, samples yeah, for, for microscopy. Yeah. So I don't know, um, I, I guess I'm just going to, uh, to leave it now and we're going to see how well this actually worked now. Okay, just a second. So, I've now also organized myself a little glass jar for the waste, okay? And here I've got also some methylene blue solution and I'm just going to turn off this arrow as well. So, now let's have, now let's have a look. This looks good. And this does not look good. Okay, so we've learned something here. Just want to show this to you. Okay, um, that's uh, actually uh, quite a uh, good that we use two different concentrations uh, because it actually illustrates exactly that what I wanted to show you. So um, okay, so look, this is the one where I added uh, a small amount of honey um, and a lot of water. I don't know if you're able to see this. Let's refocus this. Uh, but there is a. Yeah, a pellet down here. I don't know if you're able to see this properly. Yeah, but there is a, a small deposit here. Okay, uh, with solid material. Let's put this in, into the glass over here. And over here, where I had a lot of uh, honey with little water, um, I don't see anything here. So evidently the visco... Well, a little bit, maybe. I don't know. This is very little. I don't know if you're able to see this here, right? Um, so it actually shows that uh, maybe for the whole thing to be successful, um, do not use uh, too much honey, otherwise it's going to become too thick. I mean, there's also some kind of a deposit over here on top, but this might be some honey that has not yet dissolved maybe. But actually, I don't know. It, it looks very yeah, dark, not, not dark, but very uh, opaque. So maybe it's not even honey, but this one over here has worked. So what I'm going to do first is, is very carefully, either you use a pipette, yeah, or in my case, I'm going to carefully simply decant this. Okay. And ah, now, now you, maybe you're able to see it better over here. It's, uh, yeah, there is, yeah. I don't know, can I refocus this somehow? There is now something gray here, right? That's the pellet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other one over here. I mean, let's let's see if we yeah have anything here. There's almost nothing. No, I'm not able to see anything. So little, yeah, a little bit maybe. Yeah. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. You see here, it's almost a, a, a tiny line here. Yeah. And so mm, I don't know. So what I'm going to do now is the following: is, is I'm going to now use a pipette, and I'm going to resuspend 
whatever we've got here. And uh, generally what I'm doing is I'm just going to use this little dropper of liquid that we have in here. So this is not going to be a very, I think, I mean, but look, there is some stuff over here. Yeah, here on top of the tube. Yeah, I don't know if this is something. Yeah, uh, but um, I just resuspend the pellet. But this, there is so little here. It doesn't, it's kind of weird. The pipette doesn't seem to work. Could it be that it got clogged? Because maybe that's a good sign. Because if it gets clogged, then this means that there is some solid material there. Yeah, no, it's not only clogged, it is so viscous that I have a problem pulling it up from the pipette. Okay, I'm just going to stir it like this. And let's put this, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, t I have no idea how much I'm able to, to actually see here. Yeah. So let's put a little bit of this, yeah. And uh, so this is the one with a lot of honey. We focus. And uh, yeah, we're gonna see how, how well this actually worked. Okay, just make sure they have only one of the cover glasses. Look, look, uh, it's so thick still that, yeah. So let's have a look. I'm going to now switch over to the microscope view. Let's remove the other slide here. And uh, this is gonna, so this is now the one with uh, a lot of honey and little water. And uh, I mean, there's some stuff here. Yeah, you, uh, those, those fibers that you see uh, could be some contaminants uh, be, when I wipe the slide, so I wouldn't. Oh, those things here, and they look like setae. Setae are some hair of insects, so maybe those pointed things here could be some kind of a, you know, some kind of a, I don't know, insect part, I hope. Yeah, but I mean, there are some pollen here. I mean, it did work, kind of, I don't know. We're gonna let's we're gonna compare it to the other one. Yeah. It'd be kind of interesting to figure out what all of these things are. Um, occasionally, you do see some uh, notable structures from indeed from bees. Um, yeah. So, but I don't know. Yeah, here, here, this here is a is a pollen. Yeah, it works, but compared to my other try, I don't know. Yeah. Um, let's simply try the other one. Where we've got the big pellet, where is where did I put it? Ah, here, that's the one over here. And um, there is, yeah. Let's just try this. Uh, I'm also checking a little bit on the time. And uh, yeah, this you see, this actually goes much better. Yeah, it it pulls up much better because it's much less viscous. Okay. Okay. Let, let's give this one a try now. I need another microscope slide, a tiny drop. Let's put the rest back. We trash the tip. And my fingers already feel sticky <laughs> because of the honey. And the uh, cover glass goes on top. Yep. And yeah. And uh, let's have another look at the microscope view. So this is the one with a lot of honey, and this is the one same magnification with yeah. And I think we do see first of all that the liquid flows much better, and of course we also see now indeed a lot of pollen. So uh, I think the thing that I have also learned today is is uh, more is not always better. And if you use too much honey, so I guess that there must be some kind of an optimum. Ooh, is this a conidium here? Uh-huh. 
That's also nice. This, this looks a little bit like a conidium. Uh, conidia are, um, are fungal spores. Yeah. Which is, of course, possible. I mean, the bees uh, collect uh, things, so of course, there might be also some fungal spores in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I wonder if you'll find a varroa mite. Probably not because of the high rotation of the centrifuge. No, yeah. And um, uh, I also don't think that you're going to find them because they would be quite large. So this means that, um, if, that the honey, must, I'm quite sure, is filtered in some way. And uh, so any larger particles would actually be removed. And uh, normally the varroa mites are actually found, they're pretty, they're pretty large compared to the pollen, right? Um, so they will also be found on the outside of the, of the bee. So I don't think that they normally should find their way into the honey. Wouldn't surprise me though. But I guess um, if maro varroa mites or anything similar and similar size were to be found, then probably also other particles like bee particles or insect bee legs or whatever would also be present. Huh? Um, so um, I'm quite sure that there is some kind of filtering. Yeah, yeah there must be uh, some kind of filtering must have happened. Yeah, so I mean, if you want to see a little co some colors here, we can also do that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and uh, just by looking at the pollen, we can of course see that there are many different types and different shapes and, and so on uh, present. And uh, what I wonder is, is if we are now actually yeah, changing the sugar concentration, if some of them would actually start to form pollen tubes. I don't know. Um, I'm now using, you can actually see it on, on top. Well, <laughs> it doesn't, you won't be able to see the, the, the it's a 60 times. It's a 60 times objective. And um, I, I mean, I do have a 100 times oil immersion objective as well, but I rarely use it. Yeah. Um, I do not have a lot of, yeah, I don't have a, a sample is very thin. So I'm just going to show you if you want to, I can now use all the 100 times oil immersion without immersion oil. So it's going to look horrible. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, let's move, oh, yeah. So this is actually the, yeah, and I have to refocus. And. This is now the 100 times magnification yeah, without immersion oil. So it's uh, fairly blurry. Yeah. So the tiny movement of the particles that you see here, of course, is Brownian motion. That's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, as well. Filtration is indeed used to remove impurities like debris and air bubbles so that the honey stays a clear liquid for longer. This is aesthetically appealing uh, to many consumers. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Okay. Um, this was just a guess that the honey is filtered from my side because otherwise I would expect indeed uh, larger particles as well. Yeah. And of course, uh, if uh, uh, consumers then see stuff floating around in the honey, then <laughs> it might not be. Yeah. They might not like it so much. Oop, I bumped into it. Ah, here it is. I was looking for this. I was looking for this. Ah, finally. Okay. Let me see. You see this uh, feather-like structure here? That is actually uh, um, a structure from a bee. Yeah. So um, I've, uh, yeah, in honey, I found this several times already. Not very common, but um, yeah, I found it that uh, this feather, feathery type uh, structure here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And uh, I know this is a weird question, but do you use a cover glass when using immersion oil? Ah, it's not a weird question at all. It, because that's actually, um, it depends. Okay. Um, if I were, uh, it depends whether you have a so-called a heat fixed slide or not. Um, you can use the oil immersion um, objective with or without cover glass. In this case, um, where I have a, a, a liquid yeah, a specimen like 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 this. Uh, yeah, the one that you're looking at right now. I have to put a cover glass on top, and then um, I can put a uh, immersion oil um, on top of the cover glass. But this only makes sense if really if the the the, the, the specimen is very thin. Okay, 
Uh, so that it must be really very, yeah, the cover glass must not float at all. Yeah. So then you must, of course, put a, a cover glass on top because you cannot put the immersion oil directly on water. Now, in the case of heat fixed slides, in which case you are drying the slide, air drying it, and then you're heat fixing it by pulling it through a gas flame. And this uh, causes the bacteria and the cells to be baked, so to say, uh, to the glass slide. In this case, um, the, you can put the immersion oil directly on the specimen because they are now baked and uh, to the glass slide. It's a little bit like, like uh, when an egg sticks to a frying pan because the proteins, they form uh, denature and they form cross networks with the glass. Um, and uh, then the cells will actually stick uh, to the glass surface. And then when you put the immersion oil directly on top of it, um, then you um, the immersion oil cannot uh, wash away the cells, right? Um, and they stay yeah, um, put, right? Um, and also it's dry in any case, so you and therefore it's not a problem. But you, I cannot put I cannot put immersion oil directly on obviously uh, directly on on water. And for this reason, uh, in this case, I would have to use uh, um, a cover glass. Yeah. Um, did you ever show a do-it-yourself centrifuge on the channel? Maybe refer to the video, make one. Uh, I did, uh, yes, a couple of, uh, several weeks ago, um, uh, one of my viewers actually made a centrifuge using a, a drill, an electric drill, and put something on there. And I think uh, several years ago, I also tried to make a centrifuge like that. Um, I know that somebody once requested uh, to make a paper centrifuge, and this is uh, indeed possible as well, especially if you want to centrifuge blood. Um, and this gives very high speed rotations, but I have not managed to do that. Okay, so this is a little bit of a, um, yeah, a thing. So please, if you check a little bit, a couple of weeks back, a few months back, um, I actually made a live, uh, I made a live uh, a stream where people also kind of showed some of their do-it-yourself centrifuges, okay, using a drill um, and also using a, a motor, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, there is another comment here. I kept bees many years ago and still have an excellent book called uh, Paul Lode of the uh, Honey Bee. Okay, first published in 1952, but my copy is a facsimile from 74. Yes, uh, thank you. And what I would suggest is, is that you uh, uh, all try to find uh, scanned PDFs uh, online. Okay, so what I would like to do now is, is a simple, what time is it? What time is it now? Okay, it's almost one hour. What I'm going to do now is, is I would like to um, add a little bit of methylene blue stain simply to see how, um, how it actually reacts with the, with the pollen that I have here. Okay. And in order to properly mix it, I will do now the following. Just a second. Where is the desk here? And, ooh, see, I already forgot this is... Okay, I don't remember which tube I actually had for... Uh, I think that this was the one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to now mix some of this, um, yeah, suspension with a little bit of methylene blue. I'm just going to use the same slide over here. Uh, normally you can add some methylene blue over here in the corner and then wait until it kind of uh, um, is pulled in beneath the, the cover glass. For, But um, today I'm going to be just a little very direct. I'm just going to add a little bit of methylene blue right on the top. Okay, You should always mix it to really make sure that this is uh, it's called Löffler's solution. It's uh, um, because if you use uh, just pure methylene blue, it's way too concentrated. So this is a ready-made mixture, and uh, it also contains some alcohol. So one should not. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, maybe this causes also some kind of deformation of the pollen because alcohol generally dehydrates. Look at this. It, the, the cover glass is floating around. I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply, yeah, maybe. Uh, remove and of course because I added now a lot of liquid uh, this means that everything is going to be much more diluted again uh, maybe or maybe do something like this here and also to remove some of the excess okay uh, adding any amount of liquid of course is going to dilute it yet further so let's give it a try okay um, scope view let's have a look let's start again at the low power here Let's move over to this here. It is a way to... And, uh, yes, look at this. 
we can actually see it much better. Okay, so let's go up with the magnification. And yeah, and uh, methylene blue has the tendency to, to stain quite uh, uh, pretty much everything <laughs> which is uh, of somehow cellular or biological origin. I think methylene blue, what it actually does, it does stain also reacts with the DNA. Yeah, and uh, let's have a look further. Yeah. Yeah, you can actually now see that there is indeed, yeah. But this uh, makes everything also significantly darker. So, yeah, you don't see the things quite as, as well. Yeah, it's just all the pollen appear now like dark, dark blobs. Okay. Yeah. But it kind of shows a little bit, and that's I think the important thing about uh, the about staining in general is um, even though um, I added the stain over everything, you see that the background um, is still fairly bright because the the cells or the pollen yeah they start to accumulate the pigment, and uh, of course now we see that uh, there are not quite as many pollen as before because I added uh, more liquid and this kind of diluted them yet more. Let's go sixty times. Let's see, it's too dark. It's, it's, okay. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So not not so many now visible because you know, here is another one. Yeah. So I asked my teacher how do diatoms really locomote, and she said they are free living and don't locomote. What are your thoughts about it? What, what do you mean with locomote means actually move? Well. Um, honestly, there are diatoms that do move. They have a gliding motion. I made some videos of that. Looks quite nice on time lapse. And um, ind indeed, many diatoms don't move, uh, but some do move. And they move, and I don't understand fully how. And I did a little bit of research, and they, then I read that scientists also do not fully understand how this works, but actually they are gliding along. So they do not have flagella um, that spin, but they're, they're, they're gliding along a surface. Yeah, and uh, yes, uh, the answer is very clear. Some diatoms um, actually do move, and if you want to to see some of them move, uh, just recently I made a video um, where I talked about uh, uh, I think I called it "Forever Young" about the aging of the about the aging of microorganisms, and uh, there I'm also showing you just a few last week or so I made a video. Check uh, check this uh, channel, um, and there you're going to see in time lapse some of the moving diatoms. Okay, but uh, many of them don't move, right? so it really depends. Yeah? So, um, so <laughs> these are COVID-19 viruses. No, uh, you cannot see viruses with a light microscope. Yeah? Um, so, I'm just reading the comments here. Yeah. Yeah, so yes, so there's a comment here that uh, yeah for a uh, for um, yeah a motor, a drill, angle grinder, yeah, and uh, you can make your own. You can make your own centrif centrifuges, and uh, just be careful that you don't have parts flying around. Yeah. Yeah, here, that's again the one from before. Yeah. So, um, what time is it? I've been now talking for an hour approximately. What I would like to do now is I'm gonna just because I uh, look. This is a spiky one over here. Um, just because I want to talk a little bit about some theory, not theory, but um, some science philosophy, because occasionally I do receive questions uh, on, yeah, on either on the forum or per email or it's again, uh, yeah, um, or uh, in the comments section. And uh, yeah, sometimes I don't really know how to answer this very quickly <laughs> in the comments. So sometimes um, I'm uh, um, uh, it's easier for me to make a separate video or a description, okay? Um, the thing, but before I do that, there is an, uh, uh, Alexandre um, is asking, can we use polarized light? We have sugar here. Well, first of all, the sugar that we have here is dissolved in water, so we will not see a polarization effect. Okay, so this is uh, polarization only works if the sugar is crystallized. So what I'd have to do is, is I'd have to wait until the water actually evaporates and crystals start to form. And then you would probably see the crystals also better in polarized light. I, as a matter of fact, do have polarized light because of a DIC microscope. And this allows me to do things like this. Okay, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's not the traditional polarization setup. 
Yeah. So this is the thing for sugar. You um, to see it uh, nicely, you should um, have sugar crystals. So yeah, some of one of those uh, little these questions here because a lot of not a lot but not really it happens to people um, in the microscopy channel they want to know something about viruses are viruses alive um, can you see viruses especially with COVID-19 we, we know luckily it's over this time uh, mostly <laughs> um, and we don't have a lockdown anymore um, but of course this uh, moved the whole discussion about viruses um, into um, into the public <laughs> yeah sphere and uh, people got interested about viruses and and um, this is a, one of the questions that was actually posted on 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 uh, on uh, you know, beneath one of my youtube videos and then i wanted to already start to to write an answer as well gee if I, start, I could write essays about this right and uh, i didn't know how to answer this um, first of all you cannot see viruses with a light microscope okay because uh, i gotta correct myself a little bit um, generally, you cannot see viruses with a light microscope because the size of viruses is below the resolution limit um, of a microscope. Okay. Um, why did I qualify myself a little bit? Is because if you use dark field um, and if the virus has a sufficiently high difference in refractive index, you are actually able to see particles of the size of viruses. Um, as a bright spot, but you're not able to see details. And this bright spot will actually be larger than the virus. It will be a diffraction pattern only. And so you're not able to get any information and you don't know if it's a virus or not because anything that uh, causes the light to diffract will result in a, in, in, a, in a bright spot on a dark background, right? So this basically means, can you see my viruses under the microscope? Well, you could make them visible, but then you don't know that they are viruses because it could be anything else as well, um, as long as the contrast is high enough and as long as you're able to see those diffraction patterns. Yeah? Um, so this is a, 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 one of the things. The first, when I um, read this question, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit like Alexandra is saying, it's part of the birds don't exist movement is this person kind of doubting the existence of viruses um, well it works like this that um, the viruses indeed were discovered in such a way that um, they were filtering i mean they discovered bacteria first and then they discovered that there are some infectious particles out there that are able to go through a filter so you take some infectious material maybe some infected blood of an animal you filter it and then they discovered that this filtered liquid is also infectious but they couldn't see anything with a microscope, right? So evidently there must be something there that is infectious, which is too small to be seen by a microscope, right? And now this could be, of course, well, maybe these are some poisons, right? Some chemicals, um, because chemicals, poisons also are, would go through a filter. Um, but then they discovered that uh, if you are actually filled, if it were a poison, then actually the concentration should go down. You inject it in an, another animal and then the concentration should go down. But they discovered that actually it started to reproduce, right? And so the, the, this animal was, became infectious again for the third, for the fourth, for the fifth animal. Yeah? So evidently it must somehow be able to reproduce, right? And this is how they discovered that this is um, yeah, something which is not behaving like a normal poison. Um, because if you were to take a poison and inject it into an animal and the animal dies and you take the blood of that animal and inject it into the next animal, then the concentration goes down, right? So it shouldn't be a problem. But they found out, no, it doesn't go down. It kind of reproduces and it's the third, fourth, fifth animal in the sequence is as infectious as the first one. Yeah? So this is kind of how they concluded that there must be something there which is smaller than what you're able to see with a microscope, you, it, does, it goes through filters, right? But it's still able to somehow reproduce. Yeah? This is how, how basically how they discovered um, the, uh, the viruses. And uh, the question is now, so this is kind of more the science aspect. And then now, can you prove that viruses exist? And now all of a sudden, when I read this question, all of a sudden my, my, my philosopher's mind, uh, because I also teach uh, philosophy of science in school, started to also switch uh, on a little bit. And I uh, said, well, actually, if you're very strict about it in the natural sciences, and if you follow the 
principles of Sir Karl Popper, he was a, a science philosopher, then nothing can ever be proven with certainty in the sciences. And everything is a question of probability, and theories remain valid until disproven. So there is evidence, of course there is evidence that viruses exist, we have DNA evidence, we can see them with, under electron microscopes, we've got, um, yeah, we know how they reproduce in very great detail, right? Um, so, um, but if you want to say that you can always say well can we trust the electron microscopes right you know, there's always a yeah can i trust if i show you something under the microscope over here um yeah like uh, yeah this one over here we, we see some 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 stained pollen grains you can always say well how do you know that uh, actually the microscope doesn't kind of i don't know invent something right um, can you prove that well, the microscope actually works, right? So if you want, so you can always keep on keep on playing that game. But there's always ultimately an, an element of, of of where you have to say, come on, um, with certainly uh, it's the probability that uh, they exist is so high that you can be actually certain um, about it, right? It's the same thing. Um, all living things are made of cells, right? Um, I have not seen all living things yet. And if I say all living things, all organisms are made of cells, I'm talking about in the past, in the future, and currently, but I've not seen all living things yet, right? Um, but according to Sir, Sir Karl Popper, um, if you want to, uh, you can go out and you can find me one living thing which is not made of cells. And then you have proven the theory wrong, um, and uh, so far this has not happened, right? Uh, and they, anyone can grab a microscope and find me a living thing which is not made of cells. Has not happened. Yeah? So this is uh, the thing here, yeah? Um, a little bit that um, yeah, prove that viruses exist is is can you prove that atoms exist? I haven't yeah. <laughs> can you prove that I don't know black holes exist in in space? Right? Um, people have known that black holes existed even before you could see black holes because black holes are don't emit any radiation. Now they discovered actually that they do. Uh, Hawking radiation. Forget about it. It's astronomy. Uh, but. Essentially, the uh, yeah you could uh, they, they could infer this simply from from the behavior of, of stars and objects around the, the the black hole. You know you can infer something, and we can also infer viruses simply by the results that they have. And nowadays we can of course also see them under the microscope, uh, provided that you have an electron microscope, right? So the, yeah. Um, is it true that you can see viruses with a transmission electron microscope (TEMs)? Of course. Of course, you can use a transmission electron microscope and you can use scanning electron microscopes. And if you uh, Google it, you are going to find a lot of pictures. It's, it's not, 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 not difficult. Huh? So um, the thing is only that, uh, that uh, electron microscopes, um, essentially, they have a much, electrons have a much shorter wavelength. And for this reason, um, for this reason, um, you're able to resolve it. Uh, because I've been talking about viruses, if you just joined the live stream, what we're looking here are not viruses. These are, uh, over here, these are pollen grains, uh, which are isolated from honey, okay? So just otherwise, some people might be confused a little bit why I talk about viruses and I uh, show you these things here. These are not viruses, these are pollen grains. And yeah, yeah. these are, of course, uh, yeah, huge yeah? Compared, uh, compared to viruses. Yeah? So... Um, yeah, fluorescence microscopy was also a question over here. Yeah. Um, uh, recently, I saw a person selling some tiny phytoplanktons which show bioluminescence. I thought it would be cool to observe them under a microscope. Yes, but I don't have them. <laughs> okay, so there are certain pl planktons out there that um, um, also, um, for example, in some regions, some some cool YouTube videos are available as well. If you walk through the uh, to the, I think I think it's called dinoflagellates. They are called. If you walk through the water um, and if they disturb, they start to glow. It's called bioluminescence. Yeah, and it would be also quite interesting to observe. Yeah, so um, I'm reading again some of the things here I knew about. Okay, yeah, it's birds don't exist movement. That's a little bit the birds don't exist movement is a, a hoax movement. Yeah, um, but I think a lot of people want to know something about viruses, especially because they're interested and they want to see viruses using light microscopes. And I say, sorry, light microscopes they basically um, are not able to resolve any details. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I'm just thinking a little bit uh, more. Um, yeah, what else do I have here? Maybe I'm going to try this here. Um, let's go back to the desk view. I would like to uh, simply check what this here is uh, over here. This is uh, from the tube from before where there was very little um, 
yeah, there was almost no pellet over here, but I would like to check this here because the reason is, is it could be that maybe some material deposited um, on, on the side here, okay? And I don't know if this is actually something of relevancy or not. So I'm going to take this. Uh, it could be also some simply... Mm -hmm. uh, it's not... Take a little bit. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't go off well. Yeah, and it's so little again that I'm not quite sure if there's actually something on here. Nah, I think I'm just gonna. This is not. This is too little to be uh, uh, reproducible. Mm, okay. So, but uh, yeah. And uh, I think uh, also before, if you remember, there was a little bit of honey still left over. But what we could do is, is uh, maybe, what time is it? Yeah, uh, in a few minutes I would like to stop. What I would like to do now, maybe this is just for comparison, let's put some honey directly on, on here. I need to get a little bit out. And let's see if we're able to um, find some pollen, some pollen directly. Uh, from the honey without centrifugation. See, it is. I'm not even able to take it up here. It's too. Yeah. So let's just, just transfer it like this. It'd be quite interesting to see. Yeah, if centrifugation would be. I don't know. If we're able to see a lot here, then it actually shows that centrifugation would be completely pointless. But what we expect here is. Um, we expect here a very low concentration of pollen. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay. So let's have a look. And centrifuge. No, that's the wrong one. Here, here it is. Let's see. Let's turn down the light intensity. Yeah, look. I mean, there might be a, f I don't know, there might be a few of them here. Yes, I found some. Yeah, there, here, here is one. And I don't know, maybe over here is another one. I don't know, could be. Go up a little bit here to see this. Yes, that's also pollen. See how the honey actually starts to care slowly spread. Yeah, but I think you do get the idea that uh, centrifuging it actually, um, yeah, it does pay off. Yeah, if you don't have here or two. Maybe, yeah. Again, if you don't have a centrifuge, uh, mix uh, mix it with water. Ah, here, a few. Mix it with water and then let it stand um, overnight. Yeah. A short question. Uh, to heat fixing blood, I always wash away the blood after uh, after staining with methylene blue. The blood is fired by air heat fixed and then stained. I Just a second. Uh, a short question. I always wash away the blood after staining it with methylene blue, the blood is fired by air heat, air heat fixed and then stained. Huh. Uh, normally, hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. okay, so basically, um, if I understand correctly, you're adding methylene blue and then it kind of uh, washes it away. What I've, hmm, I'd have to try this out. If he, I've not, I've have not, I have not heat fixed um, uh, blood yet. Um, what I have, however, done, and this actually does work quite well, especially if you want to see um, white blood cells, is, is if you indeed mix a little bit of methylene blue with a drop of blood and then put a cover glass directly on top of it. Um, yeah, you don't need to heat fix it, um, and uh, the blood cells are fairly large. The white blood cells are fairly large anyway, um, so they can be easily seen, um, and they're quite nicely sandwiched then between the cover glass and the microscope slide. Yeah, um, if you want to observe bacteria because they're so much smaller, uh, they would they would they're also actually also going to float vertically up and down, and th therefore it's difficult to observe them, and therefore heat fixing is indeed better. Uh, 
Yeah. And especially if you have uh, uh, several stains, like for example, gram staining, you have to exchange uh, the stain. Uh, and then of course, there's the danger of washing it away. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't know why this is, uh, I've never heat fixed blood before. And normally what you do is, is you can, you can of course air dry it. Okay, this is actually done. Um, and then it should also work. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. The blood is dried and then stained. Well, actually it, that is actually a standard procedure. Yeah. Yeah, so what are the, these colorful structures? Maybe another DIC testing. Which colorful structures are you referring to? That's the question that I have now. I mean, this is basically, I need to adjust the proper filter here. And yeah, ah, this, hey, this looks actually quite nice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So those... I mean, this here could be, of course, a pollen grain. If this is, yeah. And let's, 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 uh, yeah. And you see that, the, yeah, you see that the, the, again, the concentration is not particularly high. I'm opening the condenser now a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yep. What is this here? Yeah. So, would be another interesting thing is is to allow maybe some honey to crystallize, uh, and uh, because uh, of course honey also forms natural naturally forms crystals, and then see a little bit how the crystals look under the microscope. Yeah. Yeah. So the, this here, I don't know, but I mean, this those round structures, I don't know this one specifically, but I mean, um, yeah, pollen. That's what I'm looking for, and many of these things here are indeed pollen but i don't know this is 60 times it's actually smaller than interesting could it be an ear bubble you see that's kind of interesting what we have here we've got those two round structures the one on the left is is certainly most certainly pollen right and 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 the bright one over here i don't know um, it's also a little bit smaller than the other ones yeah or it does look a little bit like uh, crystalline indeed yeah so so maybe yeah so, um, I placed a bucket of water for nearly uh, three and a half months now, and it's changing drastically. It looks like some substrate is accumulating on the bottom. Yeah, sure. Um, what happens is the following, and I, um, I'm also, by the way, also making a, a, currently a video. I made a, this mini aquarium in a jar. And um, what will happen is, is you've got, uh, especially if you're, uh, you've got uh, sunlight and so on, then of course algae are growing. And what will happen is, is that uh, they will do photosynthesis and uh, they will therefore produce plant material, organic material. And uh, as this material dies off, it will of course settle down on the ground. Yeah? So this is actually a, a sign of, of, uh, yeah, of biological activity going on. Yeah? I've uh, got in my glass jar that I have over there, um, the video is, is uh, making a video of this uh, as well. I can also see that there are now some snails in there and they produce waste as well. And all of this stuff kind of falls down now and starts to build up on the bottom. And this is a very um, interesting place, of course, also to look for, for, um, yeah, um, for microbes. Okay, so let's have again a look here. And people, I think I'm slowly going thinking about quitting again. Um, this, that's again the one with the... Uh, yeah, so that's the one where a centrifuge is. Wow, what is this here? Yeah. Ah, look at this. Interesting. Looks almost like, like some kind of plant material here. Yeah, I don't know. Some, yeah, almost like tiny little cells that you have there. Microplastics, microplast. I mean, microplastics often look... Um, less complex. I mean, you see over here, those tiny little dots in there. So this looks a little bit like biological origin. Microplastic fibers often are from textiles. I mean, they look like fibers. Yeah. Um, so um, it, it, they look very different. And this is like, again, a nice one, a spiky one here. Yeah, yeah. so it's also quite nice. Yeah. Uh, would life eventually appear in tap water if left in a jar long enough? Ah, I love this question. <laughs> 
The thing is, uh, you can answer it in multiple different ways. If you have a jar of tap water and there are no cells in there, no bacteria, no algae, and you completely close it off, okay, then none will appear because life cannot appear on its own. Yeah, this is actually something that Louis Pasteur back 200, 300 years ago discovered. That time there was a big dispute in the scientific community. Can life appear um, on its own? And Louis Pasteur, he uh, discovered with his famous experiment that if you seal, seal it off and close it off and there are no cells in there in the first place, then none of them will appear. However, if you leave the jar open, like a, a glass jar open, yeah, um, um, of, of tap water, and if you uh, let it stand, will algae appear over time? And the chances are pretty good, yes. The reason being that uh, um, there's dust and dirt falling in into the jar, there's carbon dioxide from the air, and then photosynthesis will start, and some cells will fall in, carried by dust and dirt and wind, yeah, and, and they will continue to start to grow um, inside the jar. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, the jar itself is probably not so the issue, but I want to show you something else here. Look, um, just to show you the desk view, this water bottle of mine, right, yeah, that I'm using because I don't have running water, I just have a water bottle. Look, <laughs> maybe you're able to see that down here it looks green. Yeah. Down here it looks a little bit yellowish, greenish. And I'm absolutely quite certain that these are algae that have started to grow on the inside of the water bottle. Yeah? Every time when the water was empty, I added more water, right? Um, so um, sure, there might have been a few cells in there um, and they started to, to grow and they started to make a biofilm here. And if you want to prevent algae from growing in there, um, then what you have to do is, is you have to keep it dark because this is also one of the reasons why many water bottles are in this um, dark sleeve or container so that there is no light able to reach it so that uh, essentially um, the algae is not able to grow. And uh, water itself contains very little organic material um, and if there were some organic material in there uh, then of course uh, fungi and things like this could also start to grow. Huh? So this is uh, essentially, so the answer, uh, if you leave a, a, jar, a jar of water standing in the air, will it actually then form cells? Well, it depends um, basically on, on other conditions as well. If you leave it open, of course, it's, it's going to fall in. But if everything is closed off, and this one over here is not closed off, yeah, because, yeah this air is being pulled in and uh, fill it up um, again, then of course, uh, the conditions over time um, can be yeah, fine enough uh, for some algae to grow in here. Yeah. So, uh, wasn't the experiment about meat and flyworms? Uh, the, the covered meat did not get. Yes, uh, yeah, exactly. This was actually uh, one of those experiments. You add, you put some meat. It doesn't even have to be meat. It can be grains, wheat grains. You put them into into a room somewhere, and then you wait. Um, and then all of a sudden, after some time, you see that the wheat grains are gone, and you've got little mice there, right? Of course, nowadays we know, of course. Uh, the mice did not form out of the wheat grains, but of course uh, they started to reproduce and then and, yeah, you had yeah, wheat grains there. Or for example, fly maggots uh, on, on decomposing meat. Yeah? Of course, you know that flies came there, laid eggs, and then you had the fly maggots there. But of course, uh, a few hundred years ago, the people did not understand or know yet the reproductive life cycle of flies. So they thought maybe the meat kind of formed those fly larvae, the fly maggots on its own. right? Um, but if you keep it closed off, and if you prevent flies from reaching it, then they won't for form either. So you see, some very simple experiments can be done. But again, a few hundred years ago, people didn't know that. Yeah? So, um, and what I'm going, to, yes, um, somebody has to, uh, I know that, uh, whoa, it's one hour and 23 minutes again, time passes so quickly, so I think uh, what I'm going to do for today is I'm also going to call it a day for today, okay, I think I'm also going to call it quits, um, yeah, I did a little bit of, uh, of uh, science talk as well, hope, it, hope you don't mind, but sometimes people are also interested in that. And I uh, hope again that you got a little bit of inspiration to try something uh, yeah, uh, with uh, your microscope. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I wish you a nice week again. Um, yeah, enjoy microscopy. Happy micro hunting as always and uh, hope to see you again. And yeah, I do have also other videos on this channel. Uh, so if you want to watch them and subscribe to the channel, it would also of course help me. 
Wish you all the best. Uh, bye bye. See you next week.